Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we are talking about the final part of Elon Musk's three-part interview series with Automotive News. And then other than that, it's been a relatively quiet day for Tesla, but we do have a couple other items as well. As always, I would recommend listening to the full interview, and that link will be in the show notes. All right, I'll recap this kind of how the interview was structured. So first off, they talked about Musk's future with Tesla and if he might take a step back operationally here sometime soon. If you remember the history of Tesla, Elon Musk at some point had said that that was probably a likelihood for him. But a few years back, things definitely changed, and it seemed like Elon was all in on Tesla and envisioned being the CEO and running the company for quite a long time. He echoed that sentiment strongly in this interview, saying, quote, I think for some number of years in the future, I will continue to run the company in a way that I think will enable us to make great products that people love and provide those products all around the world and just kind of complete the roadmap that we've laid out for many years, end quote. The line of questioning then centered around if Musk was actively succession planning for himself or what that sort of looked like for Tesla. He really said that's not something that they're thinking a whole lot about right now or that he's thinking about, but he has no disillusionments of running Tesla forever. He said, obviously, at some point he'll become old and infirm, as he described it, and somebody else at that point would obviously need to take over. But the main point here is that it's far off in the future. They also talked a little bit here about organizational structure and management retention. On the structure, Elon pointed out that it's really important as the company grows to reinvent and restructure because what works on a small scale isn't necessarily going to work on a large scale. He likened it to a creature as it grows. It changes from cells, collection of cells, to growing organs, a nervous system, etc. Just like a company may add new parts and collections of people to the company over time. So he mentioned the retention of their top talent has been excellent, but over time they have had to restructure, which I think carried the implication that it might look a little bit more unstructured or unsettled from the outside. And he also importantly, I think this is really important, that is often overlooked when these arguments get brought up, is that Tesla is relentlessly recruited from, from both the automotive and the technological sectors. Elon described this by saying, quote, they want some like Tesla pixie dust or something, end quote, hoping that those employees can make their company like Tesla too. That led to an interesting conversation on Rivian. The interviewer asked if Rivian had been poaching Tesla employees and about the lawsuit that Tesla filed against Rivian for stealing trade secrets a couple weeks back, which we actually didn't cover on the podcast yet. On if that poaching was happening, Elon said, yeah, absolutely, of course. And when asked to what extent, he said, quote, I mean, it's not like a massive percentage, but they definitely have taken a bunch of Tesla intellectual property on thumb drives and on computers and stuff. It's not cool to steal our IP and for people to violate their confidentiality agreements and non-solicit agreements, that kind of thing. So yeah, they were doing bad things, so we sued them, end quote. So while we're on the subject, just a little bit more background on that suit. Tesla alleges, quote, as Tesla now knows, Rivian instructed one recently departing Tesla employee about the types of Tesla confidential information that Rivian needs. Both Rivian and the employee knew full well that taking such information would violate the employee's non-disclosure obligations to Tesla. Nonetheless, the employee expropriated for Rivian the exact information Rivian sought, highly sensitive trade secret information that would give Rivian a huge competitive advantage, end quote. The suit details indiscretions from four former Tesla employees, the first being a staff recruiter whose manager at Tesla actually left Tesla to work for Rivian and then recruited the staff manager, while also explaining that Rivian did not have the recruiting templates, structures, formulas, or documents that they would need for their recruiting efforts, at which point the staff recruiter still working at Tesla downloaded at least 16 different documents from Tesla, things like group interview processes, interview training guides, and emailed them to her personal Gmail account. As far as the other employees, one was a senior manager of staffing. She downloaded 10 confidential documents with, quote, detailed information on Tesla's candidate pipeline for senior level operation managers, including a detailed internal write-up of an executive level candidate, end quote, as well as a recruiting heat map showing Tesla's best recruiting sources. The third employee was a manager of environmental health and safety. She also downloaded and exported documents to her personal Gmail account. Tesla says, quote, these documents consisted of highly sensitive trade secret, confidential, and proprietary engineering information about manufacturing project management, control specifications for manufacturing equipment, specifications regarding manufacturing robotics, and manufacturing equipment requirements. These documents would be used rarely, if at all, by Siren as a manager of environmental health and safety, yet she exported them shortly after accepting her offer at Rivian." End quote. The circumstantial implication there would be that those documents then had been solicited since they were not directly related to this person's job. And then the fourth employee was a manager for charging programs at Tesla, left for Rivian to become the senior manager for charging development. And on the day before leaving Tesla to go to Rivian, this employee, quote, forwarded to his personal email address a list of a highly curated select group of high-level Tesla employees who are experts in the deployment, 
and management of charging networks, precisely the type of team Rivian needs to deploy its own charging network. The information would allow Rivian to target for recruitment the members of that group, which is responsible for the selection, deployment, and management of Tesla's global supercharger network." End quote. I think at one point Rivian seemed like a pretty good candidate to potentially eventually utilize Tesla's supercharger network, but I think with the investment from Amazon and now this lawsuit, especially that last employee on the charging network, I would imagine the hopes for some sort of partnership on that for Rivian would be pretty minimal at this point. As for Rivian's point of view, they told CNN in a statement, quote, This suit's allegations are baseless and run counter to Rivian's culture, ethos, and corporate policies, end quote. Adding, quote, Upon joining Rivian, we require all employees to confirm that they have not and will not introduce former employers' intellectual property into Rivian systems, end quote. So we'll just have to wait and see what comes of that. Next up in the interview was some brief discussion on regulatory credits. Elon didn't have a whole lot to say on this topic, but noted the obvious, at least to us, that Tesla would not be able to get these credits if other automakers just made electric vehicles that are compelling. It's sort of unfortunate that it is titled regulatory credits on Tesla's earnings report. I think to the uninitiated and in headlines, that tends to imply government credits, which is not at all the case. They are simply credits being paid to Tesla instead of the government because of failure to comply with government regulations. Next, they talked about the autopilot naming convention and the pushback that they've received in Germany as of late. Elon had some choice words on that, including ridiculous and idiotic. We've talked plenty about that, so no need to go into too much detail there. The next question was sort of interesting. They asked him what he wanted to accomplish with Tesla by the time he was 50, which Elon was a bit thrown off by since that's less than a year from now. But he said, quote, well, I mean, hopefully we get the, I mean, from a Tesla standpoint, get Giga Berlin and Giga Texas operating next year. That would be cool. I don't know. Maybe we will be lucky enough to get the Cybertruck into production towards the end of next year. That would be cool. I don't know if we will succeed or not, but that's worth trying, end quote. I thought the phrasing on that was pretty interesting, given the fact that Tesla exceeded their Model Y timelines by about six months, and they seem to have adopted an under-promise, over-achieve sort of guidance system. But Elon definitely presented 2021 as sort of that aspirational target for the Cybertruck, even though that is what it says right now on the website for the tri-motor variant. Given the fact that this will be coming from Gigafactory Austin, I'm sure most of us already had level set our expectations accordingly, but it's going to be a new factory, a new production process, so I definitely wouldn't expect a Model Y situation where it comes six months early, as in this case, that guidance does seem to be relatively in line with Tesla's internal goals. After that, the interviewer rephrased that question and said, okay, what about by the time you're 55 years old? Elon said, quote, I think we want to have reached volume production in all the products that have been announced, and maybe a few that haven't, and have the company be operating in a very solid way that is robust, that even if I were to die, the company would still do really well for a long time, end quote. Beyond that, Elon did reiterate without prompt that Tesla does aspire to eventually make roughly 20 million vehicles per year. Elon noted that worldwide, the total automotive fleet in operation is about 2 billion vehicles, so Tesla would aspire to turn over 1% of that each year, which would be 20 million per year. Of course, that fits with Elon's response to the question on Tesla's Q1 earnings call about maintaining that 50% compound annual growth rate. The last couple of topics were on COVID-19, the impact there. Elon said that in the U.S., compared to how the situation was handled in China, the regulations have been just a bit more haphazard and randomly applied through different geographies. Just relaying what Elon said here, I know this gets political, but he said overall they've soldiered through it and that the team has done great and there have been no serious issues. And then the last topic was whether or not anybody ever tells Elon no, and Elon said, quote, people tell me I am wrong all the time, end quote, adding that, and I won't directly quote this here, but if you ever want people to tell you you are a giant pile of something, just go on Twitter. He said that jokingly, but obviously there's some truth to that. And then he said, really, though, from a management standpoint, everyone is wrong some of the time. The first mistakes that he would like to correct are the ones that he makes. Managers should always take the attitude that they are there to serve their team. And it's not a question of if you are wrong, it's how wrong you are, with the goal of becoming less wrong over time. That's something that Elon has mentioned in regards to his optimistic timelines in the past, trying to get less wrong over time. Last couple of quick things here for today, Robin Denholm, the chair of the board for Tesla, a few days ago exercised her rights for about 26,000 shares of Tesla stock and then ended up selling those into the market. So you may see some articles about that just to clarify a couple things on that. Her option for these shares did expire next year, so between now and next August she would have had to have exercised. When you exercise these stock options, that's a taxable event, so if you don't sell any of the shares you have a huge tax burden. So generally, in a situation like this, the person doing that exercising will at least sell the number of shares to cover that tax burden. But in this case, Denholm did sell all of them. 
I do believe she still holds other shares and probably other options, but I didn't take the time to look into it because personally, I don't really care all that much about circumstances like this. Insiders sell all the time for all sorts of different reasons. I don't believe it to be a good indicator of future performance. And certainly if we look back at Tesla's history, it has not been. But if you do want to take the time to do more digging on her specific positions, there is more information out there. The last thing I would say on this is sales like this are predetermined. So this particular sale was scheduled back in May. Last thing, we do have some more executive turnover at other automakers. Ford today announced that their CEO, Jim Hackett, will be retiring and that their current chief operating officer, Jim Farley, will be taking the reins. Farley, 58, has been with Ford since 2007. We'll wait and see, obviously, but I would imagine this doesn't change the course too much for Ford. All right, that'll wrap it up for today. As always, thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and sign up for notifications. Also, make sure you're following me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And I'll see you tomorrow for the Wednesday, August 5th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.